Lucas Cantor is a composer, producer, multi-instrumentalist and speaker who's on the line with us here just now. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you doing? Yep, I'm doing great as well. So what's it like to be a composer for films and things? Is it fun? Is it fun? Man, I gotta say, well, Toby, it's great to be here with you. And we just did like a little short pre-interview and you have a really great radio voice. You you were speaking to me in your normal speaking voice and... (laughs) Threw me for a loop there. Yeah. Um, and I guess maybe that's one of the things that, uh, as a composer, you start to notice uh, little audio cues more than um, maybe most people. And they uh, mm. they tend to be a little bit more jarring. But yeah, I guess it's fun. I don't yeah. know. Is it fun being a radio host? Well, yes, it's very fun making money from things that you can't really call a job. <laughs> sure, yeah. <laughs> so what have been some of your favorite things that you've composed for? Well, I finished Schubert's Unfinished Symphony with Artificial Intelligence. Um, yeah. for, uh, and that was a project that I did with with Huawei that premiered in the UK, but has played all over the world. And it was an interesting experience. Uh, I learned a lot about AI and I learned a lot about Schubert. And mm. so, um, and as a result of that, I've been taking an interest in the history of music and technology and how they've worked together and influenced each other. And uh, mm. I'm writing a book about the subject. Mm. So that was a that was a highlight of my career for sure. Yeah. Interesting finishing a score with AI. Does that worry you that one day you might not be necessary anymore? No, it doesn't worry me at all. I don't think that uh, every time a new technology comes out, the Luddites run scared and say, this is going to end, you know, Mm. fill in the industry here. This is going to end this industry as we know it. I've seen it happen in music already in my career. And uh, I've seen, you know, some technology come along and everyone say this is going to end music as we know it. And yeah. now it's just part of the just just part of the the way we do. We do it. I think the arts are a lot more adaptive mm. than people give them credit for. And I think human ingenuity is uh, is, you know, enjoyed by other humans. So, yeah, that's true. And it's just a great tool to have, I suppose. I think so. I don't you know, I don't know how good a tool it is for music, but it is uh, AI is a great tool for a lot of things. I don't know if it's great at generating music Although the one thing that it does well that does kind of worry me is it it makes it can make pretty passable background music with basically no prompting. And for people who like to listen to who just like to have something playing in the background, like you're at the gym and you want something that kind of pumps you up, that's just generic um, music. It's pretty good at that. It, it, it's pretty good at making what I would call strip club music. <laughs> so I don't know if you've ever been to a strip club or if they have them where you are, but you know, the music in those places is like, it's, you've never heard it before, but it sounds more or less like music, but it doesn't sound like any music that anyone really made. It's just kind of yeah. beats and uh, AI can actually make that. So, yeah. so maybe strip club DJ should be worried. Yeah. I'm not going to comment on whether or not I've been to a strip club, but <laughs> oh, that's where I know you from. I thought I recognized you. <laughs> yeah. Well, you've been quite a busy guy because you've done all sorts of things haven't you and you've won a couple of emmys so that must feel good uh, yeah it's, it's it's always nice to be recognized by your peers yeah absolutely so how did you get interested in composing in the first place I, i'd always been interested in music and yeah. i went to university to study guitar and i started working after college i started working for a company that made music for television and some of the music they were making i just thought you know i could play most of these instruments i could probably make some of this yeah. and the the person who owned the studio my boss at the time said well if you want to come in when we're closed and use the studio when we're not here you're welcome to it and mm-hmm. so i started writing music it started getting some use and i um i always really wanted to work with orchestras and do you know big scores like that that's something that interested me since i was a child but i didn't i didn't know how to get into it and we didn't really know mm-hmm. anyone who who could explain it to me so um well we did but i just didn't we <laughs> we actually did have a friend who was into it we just didn't know that we did um yeah. My parents didn't know that it was something that I would be interested in. And because I just, you know, it, was, it seemed so pie in the sky for me. But mm. as I started writing music and meeting more people, I realized I was in New York at the time. And I realized that moving out to Los Angeles was where all the orchestral stuff was being made. And uh, so I moved here. And this is where I currently am. And, you know, mm. through uh, a little bit of hard work and a series of lucky breaks, I've managed to work with some great musicians and do some really good projects. Yeah. And how does it work in terms of getting cast, so to speak, on doing the score? for a film or TV program, do you have to do a lot of hassling yourself to get the work or do people come to you or is it maybe a little bit of a mixture? It's funny. I I do a lot of hustling, but I don't Mm. know if it actually has any impact because most of my... Mm. 
most of my actual work comes from someone just calls me and says, Hey, do you want to do this? I, I feel mm-hmm. like if I wasn't out there hustling that that energy might not be circulating around the universe. But, um, yeah. but I, but yeah, most of my jobs, most of, I would say 100% of my sort of marquee projects have been someone I knew called me and asked me to do it. Mm. And I take it that's developed over time. You've developed more and more relationships with people. And when you were starting out, that wouldn't have really happened as much. Yeah. Your, your network is everything and yeah. your network is whoever you happen to be with right now. That's going to be your network in the future. So yeah. um, it's, uh, it's important. Um, you know, they say in Hollywood that it's not, you know, what you know, it's who you know. And that's, yeah. that's actually false. Um, mm. it, it is who you know, but you also have to be very, very good. So yeah. it's kind of assumed, you know, everyone who moves to Hollywood and wants to be a composer, I think particularly, is pretty good at it. Um, it's not something yeah. you can fake. And so um, you do have to know the right people and you do have to get into the right situations at the right time. And there's a big element of luck that goes into that. But you also have to be able to deliver once you get into the room. Yeah. And how does scoring a film or TV program compare to writing a normal piece of music for a song? Because they're very different kind of structure, right? Yeah, I'm not, uh, I've, I don't know if I've ever written a song specifically professionally. Yeah. And sh- just for your listeners, let me clarify that. Mm. Like a song is, you know, a piece of music with lyrics. It's, yeah. you know, what you're thinking of is, as music. And then I would say a piece or uh, a cue is something that you would put, or a piece is something that would go on a concert stage and a cue is something that goes in a film. And so I've written songs on a um, on an amateur level, but uh, I haven't mm. written written many songs professionally. But I have done a lot of uh, concert pieces and a lot of cues, and they're different. They're different in a lot of ways. The most profound way that something for the stage is different than something for the screen is something on the screen. You're serving the picture. You're serving what uh, people are seeing, mm-hmm. and the um, and that visual aspect actually carries a good amount of weight of the emotional impact of the of the music, um, or it can anyway. Mm. Um, whereas something for a, uh, for the stage, you really have to hold the listener's attention at every, at every moment. Um, so, you know, I mean, you should do that for a cue as well, but there's, there's just some, there's a different, there's a different standard because it's, nobody's watching a movie to listen to the music. They're watching a movie to hear uh, the story told to them or to see the story unfold before them. But, um, and while storytelling and narrative and flow is very important in a concert piece too, People are really listening to the details of the music. You also, there's a conceit that it's probably a more musically sophisticated audience that's listening. And so some of the uh, tricks that would work easily in a film will not necessarily fly in a concert hall. Yeah. And of course, as you kind of briefly touched on, the score isn't something that most people are thinking about. But if you removed it entirely, people would notice that something's missing, wouldn't they? Yeah, the old trick of uh, this is something that I think any composer worth his salt has either witnessed this or done it to a classroom full of students where you play a scene with and without music or you play a famous scene with different music and Mm. of course it really changes it um one of my favorite things to tell people about music is that there's this great film called no country for old men it won an oscar for best picture 10 ish years ago and it actually has no score Mm. and you don't notice because the filmmaking is so masterful and the acting is so masterful and the editing is so masterful that you don't need a score putting a score in this film would be uh would be over the top and yeah. you know where we come in as film composers where our role as storytellers is to help the story along in places where it might not be clear from the visuals and from the writing yeah that's interesting because maybe a lot of amateur composers might instinctively want to score every little part of the film when actually you only need it when it's needed yeah the less the better i i do a lot of when I do less, um, when I do like indie films and the sort of uh, lower budget stuff, which I like to do when I like working with new directors and doing that kind of thing, I often find myself telling them like that I think certain scenes don't need music because they're working really well, or maybe they just need like a very minimal thing. But yeah, everyone has different taste. Um, but I think music is best applied sparingly. And um, but the other the other side of that is that you know if you have a film that is not great you can add a lot of music to it and make it, you know, it's kind of like putting music in a department store, which is like an inherently boring environment, but you add a little background music, it classes it up a little bit. 
And I think that's a that's a hallmark of maybe a distressed uh, a distressed movie when there's music in it wall to wall, unless it's a cartoon. Yeah. Now something else you've done, of course, is you've worked in NBC's music department for the Olympic Games in mm-hmm. Salt Lake City, Athens, Torino, Beijing, Vancouver, London, Saki, Rio, and Pyeongchang. That's quite a lot of Olympics. They keep asking yeah. you back, so they must like you. Well, and Tokyo, and um, oh, yeah. we're coming up on the next one too, in uh, in Beijing again. Oh, so, yeah. yeah, I I do that job is um it's a it's what they call music services, mm. and I'm essentially doing just the back end sort of business part of music and. It's fun. It's uh, I have a team that helps me out with it, and I've now been doing it for you know since Salt Lake City, which was 2002. So I've got it uh, pretty well figured out. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, and I, I love those guys at NBC, and uh, you know I've known them now for years. I'd do anything for them, and I if they keep asking me to do it, I'll keep doing it. Yeah, and that's exciting because you are the soundtrack of a lot of inspirational moments, aren't you? Uh, I'm I'm really the business guy who helps the soundtrack get on the air. I I don't uh. I, I do write some of the music. I do I some let me how do how do I put this? Some of the music that I have written for um, libraries that NBC has contracts with does make it into the games, and I'm always yeah. proud when that happens. But my job is to make sure that the um, my job is to, it, it's not that exciting. It's to make yeah. sure that all the like business stuff is in order for the Olympics. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, I don't want to represent that I've scored the Olympics because the yeah. music for the Olympics is written by John Williams. I think uh, most people know that. And yeah. Uh, yeah, if you hear that music and mistake it for mine, God bless you. But uh, <laughs> but John Williams wrote it. Yeah, he did the NBC News as well, doesn't he? So yeah, also Sunday NBC Night guy. Football. So, also yeah. Sunday Night Football on NBC, which um, mm. I'm guessing you're you sound like you're in a country that doesn't really care about American football, but <laughs> yeah. it's a big deal here. <laughs> Um, yeah. And uh, he's done. He's done a lot of work for NBC. He has a um, he has a longstanding relationship with NBC. Yeah. And on the subject of another games, the Hunger Games, you co-produced Lord's cover of Everybody Wants to Rule the World, which was in the Catching Fire soundtrack. Yeah, that was a that was an interesting project. We mm. um, we did that for a trailer originally, and it was in uh, 2013, let's say. Yeah. And in the summertime, some a friend of mine asked me and the the guy I was working with at the time, still a good friend of mine, Michael Levine, to do a trailer track for some movie with this singer that he knew from New Zealand. That you know he worked for BMG. They had signed her, but yeah. nothing much had happened with her. And but she he said she's got a good vibe, so she'll do this. And so we did it. And that singer ended up being Lord. Um, yeah. And so this this trailer, because Lord was unknown at the time, the we didn't actually get the trailer that we made this track for, and it just sort of mm-hmm. sat in the catalog for a few months, and then she became the biggest star on earth. And yeah. all of a sudden, the only thing that she had recorded that nobody had ever heard was this track that we had done. <laughs> and so Hunger Games wanted a world premiere for their soundtrack, and they wanted Lord, and this was the only thing available. So uh, it, I think it also helps that I think it really fit the film well, but that's mm. what I was talking about earlier um, with luck. You know, I did a good job. I My um, writing partner on that and I did a really nice job of making this track good, doing the best job that we could, and mm. then we got incredibly lucky. Mm. So, yeah. Yeah, that's incredible. You got there before she was famous. Yeah, exactly. It's, um, it's very, it was a very, uh, it was a lucky break, and it's um because it was such a known hit i mean i still yeah. i still see it on briefs people still still remember it so mm. and how's film scoring worked since covid because there will have been times where you can't have an orchestra in the same room together because of distancing and things yeah there was a few weeks where it was a problem um mm. but it's you know one of the things that we you know, I had a Zoom subscription for years before <laughs> COVID started. This is this is uh, like working remotely, recording remotely. This is something that we have been doing for a long time already. Because yeah. if you're a, I'm a guitar player, so one of the things that I do in addition to scoring is I'll play guitar and other, you know, mandolin, banjo, other guitar type instruments on other people's scores, and I do that entirely from my own home studio. Hmm. So they'll send me some music and I'll record it and send it back to them. And that's uh, that's something that a lot of musicians do. And I can, you know, because I have high quality equipment, I can make it sound great and I can hmm. save everybody in the production a good deal of money because you don't have to rent a studio. You don't have to hire an engineer and you can get uh, a quality product. And that's especially for the lower budget things that um, that we do. That's something we've been doing for for years. You know, if I need one violin solo, I have a violinist who I know has a great home recording setup and I'll send her 
her the files. She'll send me what she records. I'll pay her electronically, and we, you know, we never have to be in the same room. Hmm. That's pretty interesting. And do you conduct as well normally, or are you kind of like to leave that to someone else? I conduct very poorly, but I have uh. conducted. <laughs> yeah. Does it? Does a? I think a lot of people don't know what a conductor does. Yeah. Um. Because if you've been to a, even if you're a classical music aficionado, it really looks like they're just standing up there waving their arms. <laughs> and the uh the job of the conductor is to connect with the orchestra and to work out the fine details of the music in rehearsal and also to like emotionally lead the orchestra in performance and. So sometimes the conductor, sometimes the composer is the best conductor for the music because they understand it the best. And sometimes they're not, but I'm not a skilled conductor, but I am a pretty good communicator. So I can, I can get my point across if I have to be at the head of the ensemble, but I I almost always prefer to have someone else do it. Yeah. Yeah. So what have you been up to more recently? Have you got any works that you've been working on that are out soon? Uh, Yeah. I finished a film called Failure to Protect, which is this, um, really interesting look at how child protective services in the United States can basically take your children away from you. It's a documentary. It's kind of heart wrenching. The music that I wrote for it was really unique because I used a quartet that I use all the time, uh, like a Los Angeles based string quartet. But every time I've used, I've worked with them, I've, uh, we've been in the same room and I thought, Hmm. well, we're not going to be able to do that for this project. So what I can do is put individual effects on each instrument in a way that I couldn't do if they were in the same room together. And so yeah. the score ended up being this really unique sounding electronic, but very organic uh, set of music that I'm really proud of. So that's out. That's doing festivals right now. Uh, and it will be, I think, available for general consumption in the fall of this year. Mm. And I uh, I scored a this was just a piece of advertising, but I was really proud of it because I was a um, I was a He-Man fan when I was a kid. And Netflix uh, in the spring released a released a new version of He-Man and they hired me to do the trailer. And we did a really epic trailerized version of Bonnie Tyler's Holding Out for a Hero. Um, wow. And it won some awards. It got some love. If you if you Google He Man Netflix teaser, I think you'll find it. It has millions of views, and people seem to really like the music. So, you know, sometimes you do advertisements, and it's uh and it's anonymous. But I was just really proud of this one. So, uh, and people seem to really dig it. Yeah. And uh, and I'm working on a book. That's the Ooh. the thing I'm focused on for the next couple of months. Ooh. What's the book gonna be about? <laughs> it's gonna be about technology and yeah. technology and music and how they've co evolved over the last. Oh, yeah. 45,000 years. Yeah. It's a lot of time to cover there. How thick is this book going to be? It's going to, uh, well, it's got to be under 100,000 words, which is approximately three 300 pages. I think it's going to be yeah. short. I, I mean, if I'm being honest, and, uh, you know, I'm always honest, hmm. the um, w- there's very little known about the first 40,000 of those years. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> so it's probably going to be one chapter on that, and then, you know, mm. mostly from the Renaissance to now. Yeah. So. Are you going to write a whole chapter? <laughs> that yeah. yeah. yeah I, th- I think, you know, I'm going to. I'm going to do my best. But yeah. yeah, there's, you know, there's a lot of interesting musicology um, that borders on anthropology about prehistoric music. But, you know, how much how much can possibly be known about it? I, I've talked yeah. to some of these ethnomusicologists and they, there are, they, they do know some really fascinating things and they have some really fascinating uh, archaeological evidence to support whatever hypotheses they have. But at the end of the day, until music was recorded, we have no idea how it sounded, yeah. you know. And so we really only have, we really only know what music sounded like from about 1900 when mm. high quality of recordings were readily available to now. Yeah. I wonder what was number one in the charts in 10,000 BC. Yeah, it's probably something with a flute. <laughs> yeah. That would be my guess. I would say flute, harps, and drums. Hmm. One of the interesting things that we can track over this extended period of time in history is we know so the first instrument that we have found and identified as a musical instrument is 43,000 years old and it's a flute. Hmm. So um so we know that there were there was at least one flute 43,000 years ago and highly likely that there were many others, right? <laughs> yes. And so um the and that makes sense to have something like a flute if you're a hunter gatherer because you need to have an instrument if you're going to have an instrument at all that you can take with you. And yeah. then the the next stage of uh instrumental development that we really have records for uh, are things like lyres and harps and these are from Mesopotamian, you know, uh civilizations and that marks a really profound change, right? Because if you're a hunter gatherer, you can't have a harp because you yeah. can't carry it 
you know, and you, you also, if you're a hunter gatherer, you really can't make a harp because it takes a couple of different specialized skills in order to put an instrument like that together. You have to have woodworking. You have to have someone who can make the strings. You have to have uh, a degree of metallurgy and metalworking. And so in order to have a harp, you really need to have a city. Mm. So, so there are interesting things like that where um, you can kind of tell how people lived just based on the kinds of instruments they had available. Yeah. Well, where are we able to keep up to date with you everywhere and find your book when it comes out? Well, the I have a podcast called Book Society Pod. It's the Book Society Podcast. And every week I interview a new notable person. Sometimes it's an author. Sometimes it's a scientist. Sometimes it's yeah. just a really smart, interesting person that <laughs> I know or have uh, or have stalked on the internet until they agreed to be on my show. <laughs> and the format of the show is they pick a book that was meaningful to them and interesting to them and you know maybe something that they're sem- that was a seminal book for them or that uh that is that they love and i read it and then we talk about it for an hour so there's a new one every week the my favorite part of the show is that if you are a person who likes to read but you don't know what to read next if you pick any book that we've covered on the show you're picking a really smart person's favorite book uh-huh. and so you so you're highly likely to at least respect it if not enjoy it and what i like <laughs> to say is if you pick any three books we've covered i can guarantee you'll love one of them uh-huh. um so yeah so that's uh that's and I'm findable through booksocietypod.com, booksocietypod on Instagram, uh, and also my website, lucascantormusic.com. I love when people just email me with thoughtful, interesting questions. If you're a composer and you want to talk about, you know, music stuff in detail, or how do I how do I move out to LA and become a composer? I'm always <laughs> game to answer those questions. So, or if you want to yell at me and say that my ideas about flutes and hunter gatherers and harps are totally wrong, I'm happy to have that discussion too. <laughs> Great. Well, thanks very much for joining us here on the show today. It's been great to talk to you. My pleasure. Thank you for having me.